Okay, I'm gonna push on live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Kate Gray. Kate, are you ready to be great today? I am doing amazing. Lovely to be here, Jason. Thanks, Kate. Kate is one of the most influential speakers on business, life, and personal mastery. She has a rare ability, ability to be able to communicate a message that electrifies, entertains, and educates people on how to be the best leader, coach, consultant, or entrepreneur they can be as well as how they can leave the greatest amount of impact in the world. Kate, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. It is an absolute pleasure. I'm excited all the way from Australia to Seattle. Look at us go. Yes. And so right now in Seattle, it's 440 in the afternoon on Tuesday afternoon. What time of day is it there? It's 1040 AM. We're a day ahead. <laughs> wow. So Kate, um, you're pretty active on social media, Facebook and other platforms. And I think you did a live recently and the title was why your brain wants you to fail. So why is it so many of us are so self defeating? Like we don't believe in ourselves. Why is that? Yeah, well, it's a, ultimately our biology wants to keep us safe. And so if you combine biology with ineffective, um, an ineffective model of the world, i.e. growing up in a childhood where we're taught that we're not good enough, or perhaps we model that we're not good enough because our parents had that belief. If generational beliefs of low self-worth are handed down and you combine that with our natural biology, the brain being a survival organism wanting to keep us safe, it basically helps us perpetrate this constant sabotage of not good enough and not being worthy consistently over and over again until we recognize it and then we can start to choose to move out of it. But it's actually our biology combined with some pretty terrible beliefs that we form from zero to seven years old. And it's amazing like, how many parents are just, I will say like, you know, people in authority, like, you know, teachers, parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts are, are so like uh, lax on how they treat their kids, right? Like, yeah. it, like it starts just young, younger, hey, hey, you're stupid, you're this, you're not that. It's like, we don't really give positive messages to the like young kids, do we, like we should? No, yeah, no, we don't at all. And I think like, you have to have a license to drive a car, but like, there seems to be no kind of pre kind of training to be a parent, right? And broken people sometimes create more broken people. And it's not because they consciously want to, I do believe that all parents want the best for their children, but they don't know any different because they're just modeling and copying what they were taught from their parents. And therefore it gets just handed down and handed down until yeah. someone breaks the cycle. So if you're a bad, if you're, if you're a great, great grandparent was bad, odds are you're gonna be a bad parent, you know, if what's the stat yeah. out there? Like, you know, if you're, if your parents were in a domestic violence situation growing up, you'll probably be in one too, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. like history repeating itself, unfortunately. Totally. Absolutely. And like, that's why self-awareness is so important. And that goes for entrepreneurship and just success in life, right? Like the more self-aware we are, the more we can break and change those patterns that are holding us hostage. So Kate, why do you think some of us are more, you know, prone to being self-aware and some of us are not? Oh, that's such a good question. I feel like that's like a million dollar question. Um, well, I love, firstly, I love this term. Dr. Joe Dispenza calls it metacognition. And that's the one's ability to be self-aware and aware of our thoughts and our feelings. Um, you know, I could get super esoteric here and potentially it could be, it's a soul journey. Maybe some people's souls are in university and other people's souls are in like elementary school. It doesn't mean one's better or one's worse. It just means one's further along in the journey. And so I think the further along we are in the journey, whether we want to call it life experience or soul journey, the more ability we have to be aware of oneself. Um, I know a lot of people have done a lot of personal development work and they're still not aware of, of themselves. And I know some people have done none, but they just sent, seem to have this natural ability to see themselves. So, Kate, two-part question. What's your definition of an ecosystem and how does one develop an ecosystem? Yeah, great. Definition of an ecosystem is the environment that you create around yourself from friendship circles, um, family, because we can we can choose if we want our family in our ecosystem or not, our, our health, what we put in our bodies, how we exercise. It's the environment we choose to live in. A fish's ecosystem would be the tank that they live in, so to speak. Um, and how does one go about creating one? Was that the second part yes, of the question? Yes. Well, we want to look at 
our ecosystem in terms of is it in alignment with our values? So are the people we're choosing to spend our time with in alignment with our values? Is the food that we're putting in our body and if we do or do not exercise, is that in alignment with our values? So we go about building it through choosing to only align with things that help us on the mission that we're here to do rather than just doing what's familiar because it's always been there. And then what will happen is if we're just staying in the same ecosystem that perpetrates the thing we're trying to break out of, we're never going to break out of it. If you want a head start, change your ecosystem. Gary Vee said that to me last year when I did a, a, a mastermind with him. He said the fastest way for you to change your bank balance is to change your inner circle, change the people you hang around with. So um, I know Gary Vee had an episode one one time, a long time ago, he was talking about, you know, you know, get rid of toxic people. If your mother's bringing mm -hmm. you down, you know, get rid of your mother. You know, of course, you didn't mean get rid of your mother per se, but yeah. But I think that's hard for a lot of people, right? A lot of people, they have an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. They have one, two, several toxic people. And they're like, you know, long, lifelong friends, close relatives. Like, how do you get rid of toxic people but yet, you know, not totally destroy the relationship you might have with them? Or do you need um, to destroy that relationship? I think, well, you've got to ask yourself this. You, you can go and be honest with them, but are they even a space for your truth like are they a space to compre comprehend that you no longer want to be a part of their life because you're going somewhere else they're going to initially want to feel attacked they're going to feel unsafe because the identity that they expect to see you as you're shifting out of it and immediately when we do that everyone tells us we're crazy we're wrong um you know we've lost the plot because we're moving out of the identity that's familiar to them so i think sometimes we do have to take a permanent break i um took a break from my mum for about three months at the beginning of this year because I, I love her dearly, but she was not at the comprehension level where if I had have come to her and said, hey, mum, like, I don't need your feedback anymore. I don't need your advice anymore. I'm very clear on where I'm going and what I'm doing. She wouldn't have been able to receive that because she's my mum. So in her mind, she has a right to give me feedback, even though I didn't want any. So I had to take that break and it was hard. But when we reconnected, no longer was there unwarranted feedback. She doesn't give me any advice anymore. She lets me be me. So we needed to take that break. But at the time, she wasn't a space to hear why. And I just really stopped reaching out to her for three months. People are probably like, oh, what an awful person. I can, I can hear them now, actually. It's okay. You can think I'm awful. I don't mind. You're welcome. <laughs> So I, I watched an interview with Snoop Dogg dig a long, long time ago, like when he first started out, he was talking about the gap. And the gap, he was like, when you're, he, your best friend's like right here. And he was growing, getting better and better. But yet his friends when it wasn't closing the gap or he would have to go down to them and say, so you said it's not on you to close the gap, it's on your other people to close the gap. Yeah. You close the gap, you just got to leave them and, you know, remember, yes. and remember the memories. So I thought that was yep, a good lesson. Yep. Um, I agree. Snoop Dogg, wisdom from Snoop Dogg. I love it. Yes. So... How do you deal with people like close friends, family, or, or what the case be, who don't get what you're doing? Like they don't get you, you're an entrepreneur, you don't have the nine to five, and they just don't get it. And, and they like, they say they support you, they're behind you, but you know that they really don't understand what you're doing. How do you deal with that? Um, I don't expect them to understand. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, I listen to Dan Pena a lot. And I really like him because I think a lot of us are too soft and he would refer to us as snowflakes. And for me, I was too soft. And so he helped balance me out. He polarized me. Yes, he can be offensive and misogynist and whatever else people want to say about him. But one thing he is, is he's tough as nails. And I need that. So I listened to him a lot. And he said that high performers, the higher the performer, the less the need for reconciliation. And I thought that's really interesting. And he expanded on that and he said, the reason there's less need to reconcile and to everyone be friends and have peace and harmony is simply because we fly alone. We're eagles. We don't need approval. We don't need people to support us. We don't need to be validated in the eyes and opinions of others. We're happy to do our own thing regardless of if the whole world's against us. It doesn't matter because we're so on mission. We have faith in that above and beyond everything else. So if we can start to not put as much attention on whether people agree with us or support us and go, I've got this regardless, 
If they like me, they hate me, they support me, they don't support me, it doesn't matter. I'm going to win anyway. So I don't actually need them. We need to shift into that mindset rather even than even worrying if they support us or not. Even if they say they do. Most people are not metacognitive, remember? <laughs> that good old word. So they're not going to know anyway. <laughs> so just let them go. Do your own thing. Be an eagle, fly alone, and then you'll find other eagles. But until you commit to that, you'll just keep getting dragged back into other people's crap. Exactly. Kate, talk about the points, just not for entrepreneurs, but it's people in general to put yourself out there, you know, do public speaking, put yourself on social media. I think a lot of entrepreneurs or people trying to find jobs or whatever case may be like, oh, I don't want to post anything. I don't want to public speak, you know, because someone like, you know, might agree, not, not you know, agree with me. Can you talk about the points of, you no, know, you need to put yourself out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a quote from Dr. John Martini, which I kind of just bastardized slightly just then and it said I would rather have the whole world against me than my own soul so if you truly are here to do the thing that you say that you want to do whether it's being an entrepreneur a thought leader or an Instagram famous a teacher whatever it is you want to do if that is in your soul to do and you don't do it you are literally committing violence against your own soul <laughs> so have the whole world against you. And if they are against you, that's wonderful because it means you're pioneering something new. No great pioneers and visionaries achieved anything in life without being hated. If people hate me, I'm excited because it means I'm onto something because I'm, I'm only hated when I'm breaking paradigms down that are commonly believed. And how can we create anything new in the world if we don't break down paradigms? So if that's something you're concerned about, I would actually question your intention and your connection to your mission about Above and beyond worried about or you being worried about what people will say about you. That's just a symptom to the fact that you haven't owned what you're here to do. Okay. So we're going to talk about your coaching in more detail in a little bit, but right now mm -hmm. I just had a question come up. When you get clients, how can you tell that they're really all in and they really want to be entrepreneur or this want to be like a hobby, so to speak? Is, can you tell the difference? Yes. So the difference between a hobbyist and an entrepreneur. I love it. There's so many hobbyists. Um, you know what, Jason, it's actually very much a feeling now. I've done this for such a long time because sometimes people say all the right things, but they actually lack the self-awareness. They, they, they lack the tenacity and the follow through. One thing that I can really identify with is if they don't truly give a crap about whether people hate them or not, whether they're resilient enough to walk through fire. One of my earliest mentors said to me, um, entrepreneurs are fire walkers. And he said, we're, we're, we dance in chaos. He's like, unless you're willing to dance in chaos and walk on fire and, and forge yourself in the, the depths of hell, don't do this job. <laughs> so those who are willing to let go of what it needs to look like and actually really suffer for their for their art because it's an art form entrepreneurship then they will win but if they're not willing to suffer and be hated generally they're not going to win kate so you're pretty active on social media but do you have a, a favorite platform yeah facebook facebook <laughs> i know so why, everyone why you hates like, it why you like hate, <laughs> why, so why facebook um i just find i can eat, i really like the live platform mm. so i can actually engage with people um I like the long form posts. I've just built a community on Facebook, really. Like my first business was a six figure um, fitness business. And that's where I started. Like when I was, when I got on Facebook and started doing advertising on Facebook, everybody was still handing out cards in cafes in the fitness industry. And I was like, no, no, that's not going to work. We need to reach more people. And so I went online and Facebook was the first platform that I really had success on. So I feel like it's kind of nostalgic for me. Um, but I do like the live component and I also like the stories. Uh, Instagram has it as well, but I think maybe I'm too old for Instagram. Instagram seems to be the younger crowd. I'm a Facebook person. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people hate Facebook for whatever reason. You know, they'll say like it's, a, it's for like older people, but I don't know if people realize all the stuff that have Facebook has, right? I mean, all the things you know, utilize on it. I don't think people take advantage like of it. They don't. Honestly, paid advertising on Facebook is genius. That bot, that AI, that algorithm is actually so intelligent. If you're not advertising on Facebook and you have a marketing budget, you're crazy. Like, honestly, it's actually so intelligent. I can't even comprehend what it can do. It's crazy. Like for me, I should pay a, a, a third party thing to like post, put my post on Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. found by accident that Facebook has a thing called Creative Studio and you post yes. all your stuff for free on Instagram or Facebook. And I, I had no That's clue. That's so good. 
It's so good, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. I, I love it. I think one of the challenges, a lot of these social media platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, they don't do a good job of telling people how to use a, I mean, you really use a platform, I don't think, you know, it's like you have to learn it yourself by accident. There's no like manual that says, do this, do that right. That's so true. I've all learned everything by accident. Although I'm like, oh, look, I can retarget three second video views. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. Let's do that. Like just from playing around. I like the developers. Oh, I figured out everyone should be as tech savvy as me. Like, no, we're not. It just kills me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally agree with you. No, I think the creator studio is fantastic. Um, there's so many things that I'm not even familiar with that Facebook does, but I do like that. I like that I can advertise to cold audiences all across the world on their, with their interests, even the audience, um, the audience researcher where you can go in and you can actually put into Facebook, like, um, your demographic, the ages, the location, and then an interest. And it can tell you all of the, the pages that they follow and all of the things that they're interested in. And then you can go and run ads. So you can go top, say, for example, I'm looking at female entrepreneurs from 25 to 40 who follow entrepreneurship. And I can go and I can find out who their favorite politician is or where their favorite juice place is or where they shop. And so then I can target entrepreneurship and whole foods because I'm presupposing that if they shop at whole foods, they have more of a disposable income and they're going to be able to buy my products. And also that they're interested in health, which I really like to work with high performers. So they're interested in health and it just makes my targeting so much better. And it's all for free. Yeah. What's that? And so if you have a business or a marketing, you're like, man, this is great. If you're a regular person, like, well, hold on a minute. Like, how yeah, you know, how you know, how you know all this about me? Like, this is a devil's work right now. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it kind of makes me giggle because a lot of people go, oh, it must have been um, fate that I saw your ad. And I'm like, nope, it was the Facebook <laughs> algorithm. But that's okay. We can go with fate. Sure. You manifested it. It definitely wasn't the algorithm. No, not at all. <laughs> And, and that's another good point. Like there's so many people who complain about Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm like, it's free. Like how you complain about something that's free, right? Like whenever you do an algorithm change or, you know, update, whatever, everyone complains. Oh, I don't like this. I don't like this. They're not doing this. Uh, it's free, right? Like, what are you doing? Like, I don't get that. It's totally it's free and we can connect with people from all over the world. Like it's, you it can make, I've made friends on Facebook that I've never even met, but like they're my friends. Like it's actually extraordinary. I think people are so busy trying to find out what's wrong with something that they just ignore actually what's right with it and love it or hate it. And there's a lot of discussion right now with it, censorship and all of that stuff, but there's so many positive attributes. I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You just can't as a, a marketer, get a better platform to one, do market research on and two, reach a target audience on. And then, you know, people talk about like, you know, censorship on social media platforms. Last time I checked, it was a private company, right? It's not the government censorship, it's the private company, right? So I would understand the private censorship thing, to be honest with you, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's not a government organization, it's owned privately. So if they want to send it's and again, that's why we need to build an email list, right? Like people mm -hmm. talk about, oh, email marketing instead. Well, no, it's not because if they decide to change the guidelines of Facebook, which they can because it's a privately owned company and you don't have the data of the people that you've been marketing to, well, then you're a little bit silly. So like we've got to understand we don't we don't own that platform. We're a guest on that platform. We have to work within their guidelines. And some, so many people don't get that. They think it's their own personal platform. Like, no, it's not your personal platform, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Unless it's your Mark Zuckerberg and then yes, it's yours and whoever's on the board. <laughs> exactly. Um, are there any new platforms out there you're going to, you can check it like TikTok or something else like that, or something coming on that you're interested in yeah. or want to try out? I definitely like I'm TikTok. When I spent some time with Gary V last year, he was all about TikTok. And so I got on it then. He's like, you've got to get on TikTok. Like, you know, he was telling everyone like, it's the new thing, get on TikTok. And I find it confusing. <laughs> so I will get on it more, but I'm a year past and I'm still yeah. confused by the it. The thing about TikTok is just so entertaining, right? I, I, I would find myself, oh man, I've just wasted an hour going through videos because it's so <laughs> entertaining, right? To people doing like crazy things and great things, right? Yeah, yeah. I think in terms of like video marketing, like the little like where they do the pointing and they mm -hmm. do all the dances, it's great. Like video is definitely the place where I believe the market is heading. Like TikTok's yeah. a perfect example of that. The reels on Instagram, I mean, 
Instagram gave IGTV a push a while ago now, but it's just showing that, you know, if you want to be successful, find out where the market's going and get there first, yeah. right? Well, video marketing is 100% where we're going as a society. So marketers need to be ahead of that. So TikTok, I, I kind of need to get my shit together with that one. And yeah, I'll be TikToking in no time. <laughs> there's a guy on our follow. He's like, I think he's like 75 year old psychiatrist. He got like a little video advice on psychiatry and stuff. So, so everyone's really? on there, right? Yeah. 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 I feel really silly. It's <laughs> 75 and he figured it out. I got to lift my game. <laughs> so, Kate, uh, let's switch to coaching. So there's literally like, I mean, there's lots of coaches right there, right out there, right? Some are great, some are not so great. First question is, can anyone call themselves a coach or there's some kind of certification, some kind of class, something you have to do before you can say, I'm a coach? Well, apparently anybody can these days. <laughs> um I always joke, like sometimes people do like a one day course and all of a sudden they're a coach. I mean, I, I mean, even the certifications though, I'm going to be controversial. I don't even think they really qualify a lot of people to be coaches. I think it's just a money-making scheme and you get a bit of paper at the end. Like right now. So again, Dan Pena said once, he said, would you rather have somebody mentor you that's read 10,000 books on business or somebody who's made 10,000 deals and 10,000 and ten million dollars, yeah, you know, and has not read a single book. And I'm like, well, I'd rather the person that's done the ten thousand deals and made ten million dollars than the person that's run the ten thousand books. So I think coaching is a nuanced art form that goes beyond just the intellectual understanding. You know, I find some of the best coaches have little less qualifications but more experience. They're they're results based experience above certification based um, kind of qualifications. So I think, yes, anyone can call themselves that. And I would always look at experience and in, and application and results above and beyond certifications. I mean, day. we've all seen the 16-year-old life coach, yeah. you know, <laughs> the, the marriage coach who has, who has four divorces, you know. I love mine. Um, my favorite is um, people that say, um, I'll help you find your soulmate. And they've been single for 15 years. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> This feels a little off to me. <laughs> so let's say there's someone's a coach, they're starting out. How how long does it take to be a coach before like you can like really say you're a, a quote unquote real coach, right? I mean, because it has to be hard to get your first client, you're, you know, you're just starting out. It's almost like a chicken egg thing, right? So how do you how do you do that? Yeah, I feel like you always have to make sure that you are ahead of your clients. So how do you know when you're ready to start coaching is that you at least want to have mastered that one skill that you're teaching others to do. So for example, I've never ever taught outside my zone of genius. I've only ever, as I've evolved and grown, the spectrum of what I've been able to help people has evolved and grown. However, in the beginning, I just did one thing because I had mastered that one thing and I didn't feel an integrity to teach anything outside of that. I would have other people that I would refer people to. So you start when you feel like you've mastered a skill and you're five steps ahead of your clients. One of my other mentors, Scott Oldford said to me once, he said, you know, you always want to make sure you're three to five steps ahead of, of your, your clients, because any more than five steps ahead, generally the person's disconnected from where you are and they can't really help you anyway. So as a coach, make sure you're three to five steps ahead of who you're working with in that the topic you're helping them with, and you'll be fine. Is there a difference between being a coach and being a mentor, or is it basically the same thing? I think it depends on the person saying it. I mean, I don't even like to call myself a coach or a mentor. I'm just a strategist. I tell you the strategy, whether you do it or not, it's up to you, really. I'm not going to like motivate you because I don't feel like you can motivate people. I think the point that I've gotten to in my career after doing this for such a long time is that we can't actually change people they have to change themselves as a coach or a mentor or a strategist whatever you want to call yourself you open the door but people actually have to walk through the door and many coaches and mentors they try and pick people up and find them and carry them through the door and it's just a bloody disaster because then you get made the enemy on the other side when they're like I never wanted to walk through the door so one of the reasons that I'm moving to digital courses and educational products is simply because I've got to the point where I want to empower people with my wisdom that are going to do the work I will not carry people. I, I think that that's probably one of the biggest issues with the self and personal development and coaching space is there are a lot of people out there thinking that they can change people. You cannot change anybody. That's the hard truth. You just can't. They have to change themselves. You are the compass. That's it. Kate, how did COVID affect you? 
Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> so at the beginning of the year when COVID was hitting, I, I just come off making a very bad deal. I lost 250 K. I burnt my whole market that I was marketing to decided they were no longer in alignment with who I wanted to work with and tried to, to launch a whole new business, um, to a whole new market while the whole world was in complete mania about COVID. So it affected me by making me stronger and tougher and getting me way better at my game because I had to up my game big time. So is there a difference when you coach someone in person or coach them like virtually? I think so, yeah. I think it's easier in person. Yeah, I think so too, that interaction. Yeah, I mean, even you'd probably know like workshops, virtual workshops, you know, Tony Robbins did, um, he's, what, whatever UPW online and like, yeah, cool. That's great. But it's nothing like being in the room. Is there? No. And plus, you know, like do remote zoom, you know, you, you, the easy to get distracted. You're doing other things, you know, and yeah, it's hard. I think. Agreed. Uh, yeah. Agreed. And you can see yourself. It's weird. It's like, I don't really know what I mean. It's just weird. <laughs> so, okay. With all these coaches out there, how do you recommend someone find a coach that's right for them? So there's a thing in branding called a brand lens and it's something I work with my clients on and it's where we define the three values of our personal brand or our company brand. And then when we're going to collaborate with anybody, um, whether it be a, hiring a team, whether it being doing a podcast interview, whether it being um, you know, doing a, a profit share of something, when it, whenever any collaboration is in, required, we have to make sure that they share those three values because if they don't share those three values of the brand lens, there will be a misalignment of values and it'll end up a disaster. And I know this from experience. So when you're hiring a coach, you want to apply exactly the same principles. Do they share your top three values? If they do, it will be a much more harmonious and beneficial experience. And additional to that, you want to make sure they've done what you want to do. So they, we, we buy outcomes, right? We, we buy from people who are what we want to be. So make sure that they are where you want to go. They've done what you want to do. If you need a coach for a digital business, don't hire a coach that's never owned a digital business. Like that would be dumb. Hire somebody that's done a digital business and has a six or seven figure business if that's what you want. So make sure they've done what you want to do and make sure your core values are the same. And Kate, how do you make sure you bring on the right clients for your business? Same I do exactly the same thing, core values. So I make sure our core values are the same. And I also like a lot of coaches go, oh, I really hope they work with me. And they feel like they're being interviewed by the potential client. For me, I'm interviewing the potential client. I don't need clients. I will only work with people that share my core values. I say no to more people than I say yes to. You want to make sure that you are super selective with who you work with because they will be a soundboard, either positive or negative for your business. And that can be highly advantageous or highly damaging. So I actually make sure they have the same core values as me. They're willing to do the work and I interview them. They have to prove to me that they're worthy of working with me, not the other way around. And I think a lot of coaches reverse that. And that's why they end up with disaster clients and disaster relationships. Kate, have you ever had a situation where you thought someone matched with you, but you found out later on once you started, they really didn't. And that if you yeah. if that yes, how did you deal with that situation? <laughs> Terribly. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I've made so many mistakes, Jason. I can't even begin. We could be here for hours. Um, yeah. Um, well, I fired them in one case and the second case they fired me. So basically I terminated the, the, the coaching relationship. And at one phase I realized it was a whole group program, a high ticket group program that I had started and realized that none of them were in alignment with where I wanted to go. In fact, I signed them all up from a, from a place of wounding, really, if I want to be honest. And when I got to the point of realizing I shut the program down, I just closed it. I didn't care about the money. I just closed it down. Um, so you, you end the relationship. Like I do, I'm extreme though. Some people might try and mend it, but I don't think it can be mended. Once that's happened, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of become a bit toxic at some point. So you have to end it. So off the wall question, is there like a, I don't know, like a glass door or Yelp or some kind of review for coaches that people go to and say, I had a great experience with Kate Gray or someone else. Does that sound like that exists? 
Or is it basically just word of mouth? I think it's just word of mouth. There might, I know that in Australia for NLP, they have like a, a website where you can go and see who the NLP providers are that are of certain criteria. It'd be good if coaching had something like that. I don't think they do. Um, not in Australia anyway. If I'm wrong, I would love someone to let me know where I can look. But there's kind of no level of responsibility, is there? Like anyone can call themselves a coach, firstly. Secondly, um, there's no kind of review board. Um, I don't necessarily think someone's opinion of an experience with a coach is an accurate representation because they both could just be projecting on each other and it'd be a really bad experience because they're both responsible. You know, so a bad review necessarily isn't a bad review. It could be that other person is the problem, the one leaving the review. So it's so objective. It's really difficult to kind of to have any sort of responsibility or um, kind of legal board and ramification board. There's just nothing. And even if there was like, who does, who would say it's right? Yeah, that's a good point. So Kate, when, between the, the coach and the client, who determines if it's been a success? Does the client determine if it's been successful? The coach is a combination? The reason I love business coaching is because it's, tangibly like it's results orientated people make more money they get more clients it's a win um ultimately i think oh, such a i mean this is just showing how difficult this industry is to even measure like the personal development industry and the self-development industry was created because it wasn't measurable by, I think, Mr. Wallace, he wanted to create something for an insurance, him and Napoleon Hill. I don't know if you know the history of how it was created, but it was created specifically because it wasn't measurable. So if you're talking about personal development and, and spiritual development, self-development coaches, super hard to even know how it was a win. How can you even measure changing your life? You know, if it's a spiritual coach, how can you measure upgrading one's frequency or the ability to manifest? It's almost impossible. In business, I like it because there's KPIs, there's money in, there's money out. You know, if you increase somebody's profit margin, if they have more clients, if they buy back their time, it's a win. And I think they both decide that. But in other industries, I have absolutely no idea. It's almost impossible. So let's suppose there's a client, a coach, it's, it's going pretty well. You know, the, the client is getting more KPIs, more ROIs, whatever the case may be. But is there, is there instance where even though you're successful, you might be able to coach too long and there's a risk of getting complacent and you need to move on and find a different coach? Totally agreed. Oh, yes, I think so. I think, and it's different from person to person. I think it depends on how quickly people uh, evolve. Like I have amazing clients that I've just finished with that I love dearly, deeply. And they were with me for a year as one-on-one -on -one clients. And we got, we took them to seven figures, um, which is fantastic. But it just naturally felt like it was the end of the journey together. And like, I wanted them to go and invest the money they would have invested in me in something else, like, you know, marketing, PR, whatever, or another coach potentially, but it just felt naturally like it was time to end. I think you just intuitively know it's not something that is cerebral at all. So it's like there's some coach out who are like, they'll just take on client after client, right? It doesn't matter how many they have, right? But shouldn't each coach have like a, like a number, like a limit on clients they can realistically like take care of, so to speak? I think so. I think like, well, every single client you have, you're energetically connected to. So say you have a hundred points of energy and every single client you have takes one point of energy and you have 50 clients. Well, there's only 50 points of energy left for you. How can you operate on at half capacity? Like I think you know, our responsibility as coaches is to lead the way. And if we're not energetically able to hold ourselves at full capacity, at the point where we can no longer do that, we should stop taking clients. And I speak from experience because I've messed that up. Um, not intentionally, but I went through a very dark phase in my life where a 10 year relationship ended, but all these sorts of personal things that happened. And all of a sudden I needed all my energy for me because I was going through a lot, yet I had 10 people relying on me and all going through their stuff, wanting me to hold space for them, wanting me to, which was silly because I was a business coach. I'm not sure why they wanted that. Don't do that anymore. But, um, and then it all just fell apart because I couldn't even be there for myself. So if you're teetering as a coach on the edge of, if something goes wrong, you can't be there for those clients. You have too many clients. So Kate, for every hour you spend with a client, how, how, many, how much time do you spend in prep time? depends on what we're working on um in the beginning 
probably an hour for an hour because I particularly if I if someone's a, like starting I don't really work with a lot of starters unless they've had ex, like um, companies before or successful businesses before but if we're doing a whole new branding if we're building out a whole new lead generation system um, or if we're looking at their operations and delivery and rebuilding everything probably an hour for an hour um, but as we go along and we get momentum generally everything's done in the session I don't do time sessions I do results-based sessions so if I'm there 90 minutes great if I'm there 60 minutes, great. If we're done in 30, great. Sometimes we're done in 15. Cool. We achieved our objective. Let's go and work on stuff. We're entrepreneurs. We're not here to have a cup of tea and a cake. Like, let's just get moving now. So I'm a more results orientated. So Kate, don't, of course, don't give the details. But you talk about instance, if you work for a client and like, they just made so much progress in such a such, such, such short amount of time, you're, even you were amazed at the progress they made. Yes, I have had that many times many, many times I have clients right now in some of my programs, um, in our sprint to scale program. And they just, that I'm in the, into the immersion technique. I believe if you immerse yourself in the thing that you want to achieve, you'll get there faster and then linear time, like, you know, 60 minutes, 60 seconds, 24 hours in a day that no longer exists. When you immerse yourself, you kind of step outside linear time and you can get done like literally, two years worth of work in six months. And so I've had clients that take that immersion technique and they just skyrocket very quickly. So also stepped a little bit on what on, so I remember seeing, uh, you did a, a live, I think on how to look good. In a, I'm going to wording wrong. It's like how to look good in front of a camera, how to be natural in front of a camera. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah. Cause like so many yeah. people, like they can like do a speech and once you put the camera from the deck, they freeze up, right? Like, yeah, I, I do all the time. Like, I just memorize this. Now the camera's in front of me. I, I can't memorize nothing. Right. Can you talk about yeah. how to overcome that? Yeah, sure. So I think because I did so many lives and you actually commented when we were chatting about how many Facebook lives I did. I've been doing lives for years and I think that was the best training for me to be confront, comfortable in front of the camera. And here's why on a live, you can see yourself. And so I would start to critique myself. I'd watch them back. And as I watched them back, I'll be like, oh, like I didn't use enough pauses. I was a little bit quiet. My background wasn't right. The lighting was a bit off. And I'll start to make adjustments based on what I saw. Then I would watch other people who were super good in front of a camera and compare myself to them and then go, where's the gap? What am I not doing what they, that they're doing? And then one by one, I would implement one thing and then keep watching them back and adjust and change. That's essentially how I became comfortable on camera. I do have a training, which is how to look good on camera without feeling awkward or investing a lot in expensive equipment. And I give very simple tips. Generally, the person who has the most volume is the person who has taken the most seriously in a social situation. So the biggest problem I see entrepreneurs make is because they get nervous, all of a sudden they start talking really quiet. No one can hear them. So just getting them to up their volume makes a massive difference. The next part, which you also mentioned, is they get a little, um, because the camera's on, all of a sudden all of their gestures and their facial expressions shrink. So just getting someone to open their body and to use expressions, and we actually have to, if I was talking to someone in real life, like I'm talking to you now, they would think I'm a lunatic, I'm loud, I'm expressive, I'm using gestures, but it's because so much of it gets lost on camera. So just getting people to kind of overdo their gestures, to use a lot of expression and animation, again, makes a big difference on camera. There's these little tricks and tips that you don't even realize that don't require training, that don't require hours of work or expensive equipment, but can take someone's video game to the next level completely. And so yesterday I was doing some, I was doing some videos for Crawford I'm going to do. I kept forgetting my lines, right? I kept, I couldn't remember nothing, right? I was joking my, with my guy. No, one of these actors act, and, and actors get paid so much money, right? All the overtakes they have to take. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I think you get to a point where, um, so over time, like if you're used to working with scripts, you, you can like not need them anymore. It just takes time. You can just read it once and you're fine. But when we're worried about messing it up, then we mess it up more, don't we? I do that. Yes. If I start thinking about getting it wrong, oh, it's a disaster. 75,000 takes later. But if I don't think about it, it's better. Exactly. Are you, are you speaking and then in your mind, like 20 lines, just fast forward, you try to see them all at the same time. 
Yes. Yeah. And you're thinking ahead and then you mess up the bit that you're saying in that moment. And it's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One, one thing I learned about doing like these podcasts and videos, like I used to think when people spoke in public, I, I misspoke. You didn't misspeak. You meant to say that. But I don't know. No, there's really such a thing as misspeaking, right? <laughs> there, there totally is. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. follow question. Talk about the importance of, of communication. Mm-hmm points of communication in, in coaching and leadership. Yes. Yeah. So again, Dan Pena, clearly I listen to him a lot. Um, He says you have two opportunities to make an impression. First is how you look. And second is when you open your mouth, he says a little, in a little more vulgar way than that. So if you want to improve your life, my, my first tip to people are look at how you look. What, what are you portraying through your image, through how your hair is? And specifically, because I work with a lot of women, like what you're wearing, like what is that communicating non-verbally? You're, because that is an energetic communication, what you're wearing. Second is take some courses in improving your communication skills. Very simple. There are a million courses on YouTube. Um, there are courses on like you can just Google improved communication, strategic communication, um, like communication for negotiation, communication for influence, communication for anything you can think of. And find the one that's relevant to communication for your industry. You know, some people potentially could be in the in the self-development space. So they're going to want to learn how to communicate for influence. Maybe do something like NLP. Super important. I think all coaches actually should do NLP. I think it's very important because linguistic programming is one of the ways that we can impact people and we can help them create change if we understand how to speak. Communication is fundamentally one of the most important things as a coach. If you can't communicate clearly, then you're in trouble. And then if I just want to add one thing, I said in the beginning, experience trumps certification. And I think that actually links to communication. You know, I can walk into a boardroom and I can broker a a deal in an all male boardroom and I can be as tough as nails in there, or I can go down to the local jail and I can like have a chat to the inmates because I've walked so many areas of life. I've lived on the street. I've had a drug addiction. I've brokered million dollar deals. I've spoken to royalty, to CEOs, to people that own fortune 500 companies. So the more repertoire and range we have in our behavior and our communication, the more influence you have as a coach and as a human being, no matter what your industry, it's very important. So Kate, let's talk about your drug addicts real fast. (laughs) Yeah. How, how long ago was that? That's 17 years ago. And so, I mean, that'd be a, a journey going from drug addict to like where we are right now. Can you talk a little about the process? Like, how did you, like, I mean, a lot of people say, you know, just, you know, stop doing it right. But it's, it's not that easy, right? How did you stop doing no, it, so to speak? No, I mean, um, it's not. Yeah, it's a good question. Just stop. Just stop. Yeah, that's no, no, that doesn't work. Yeah, just put um, yourself <laughs> up by the bootstraps. You just, you know, have some self-discipline. Yeah. You don't oh, want to stop. Oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> you, like, you like being on the streets and doing the stuff. If you really yeah. want to be successful, you just turn the page. Yeah, yeah. It's Well, I mean, my dad died and that was probably the catalyst. And I think that was the beginning of my self, my ability to be metacognitive, to, to observe myself. Because he died at a point in his life where he didn't achieve any of his dreams. And so being a meth addict at the time, it it really made me go, hang on a minute. Like I'm choosing to partake in something that could basically put me where he is right now, years ahead of my timeline. So you were like the real deal addict on meth. That's the, that's the real deal right there, right? You won't, you won't messing around. (laughs) No, there was no messing around (laughs) straight. I'm, I'm, I'm an extreme person. I do things by extreme. Um, yeah, so, so that was, it It was really my dad. And then from there, giving up the need for it to need to look a certain way to get off it. And I tried many things before I actually, like, I don't even want to say cured addiction is the addiction is just a symptom of disconnection. I was addicted to meth because I was disconnected from myself. I was seeking things outside of myself for connection and therefore I stumbled across drugs. Before that, there were many relationships. There were all sorts of 
partying days that I found connection in and they weared up. So they, they dried up and they dried up because nothing outside of ourselves can actually bring us true connection. And then the meth was just the final straw. And once I found reconnection to myself, the addiction stopped. But that so, was a long process. So how long were you, you know, quote unquote, addicted to meth? Thank goodness, only about 18 months. So I only used meth for 18 months. I used drugs for a lot, lot longer. <laughs> I used drugs consistently for about six years, but there were, you know, things from ketamine to MDMA um, to speed, like all sorts of, I was in the party scene. So you know, I never, never really drunk alcohol, but drugs and a changing of the mental state was, was huge. And my dad had cancer for five years. So it was generally most of the, the time my dad was sick, my addiction was there. And now I look back at it, it was because I was trying to escape what was happening to him. And it was also the greatest gift. And the, the worst thing that could ever happen to a human is losing a parent, you know, which happens to all of us, it's unavoidable, or losing a child. But it was also the greatest gift. So I'm grateful for him to this day because that woke me up out of my del delusion. So M MDA, M MDA, that's ecstasy, right? Or something different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Molly. I think it's okay. called Molly in the States. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure they have several different names for it. Yeah. So I don't know if this is a quote from you or you took a quote from someone else, but what gets measured gets achieved. I think that's so powerful, mm -hmm. right? How can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's why I love business and it's why I love marketing <laughs> um, because it's so measurable. <laughs> Click funnels, statistics, um, you got your Facebook ads, you can see all, all the data is there. Nothing in the universe is a mystery. Everything can be measured. No matter what your goal is, if you can make it measurable, you can achieve it. If you can look at data, if you can adjust based on that data, you'll eventually get there. But you've got to be willing to keep adjusting and keep changing. What gets measured gets achieved. I've heard it many times. Russell Brunson says it. Dan Pena says it. They all say it in different ways. But in business, your data, the feedback from your clients, from your advertising, from your bank balance, from the morale of your team, that's all feedback. If you can take that feedback and adjust based on the feedback and then in three months time, measure it again, or then the next day, measure it again and keep adjusting based on that, me that measurement, you will eventually get to your goal. Most people don't do that. And I don't know why it's crackers. They should definitely be doing that. Um, athletes do it. I got that from being an athlete. So from training really hard, we would measure our results in the gym. If we're lifting more, we know we're on track. If we get an injury, we know there's something wrong. It's the same in business, exactly the same thing. What's get me what gets measured gets achieved. So Kate, next, I think I remember reading on your biography or somewhere else that you, you like you do, you're involved with like medical metaphysical, I think that's what it's called. What is, what is that? Yeah. Spiritual woo woo. <laughs> That's, that's, yeah, I don't want to say that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess the meaning of existence, we could say that. What it, What is like, all of like, this? Like the meaning of life, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like why okay. are we here? Yeah. Um, and like metaphysical, esoteric. So I studied lots of different, you know, part of the gift of my addiction was my desire to find out why we suffer. And my desire to find out why we suffer led me on a journey of, of trying to find out the meaning of life. What's it all for? Why are we here? You know, from Zen Buddhism to Hinduism to the Vedic traditions, I, I looked at all of them. And at the end of the day, the conclusion I came to was just be normal, just be human. You don't need to be uber spiritual. You don't need to be anything. Just play the game of being human. Be grateful for what you have in the moment and have fun. That was literally after about... 15 years, that was my conclusion. So Kate, you've been able to, you know, put yourself in, in the area where you get mentioned by people like Gary Vaynerchuk, Scott Alford. I'm, I'm sure that did just happen, right? You just like email Gary and Scott one day, hey, come mention me. How did you put yourself in those situations to be, you know, get training from them? How did that happen for you? Oh, I paid. <laughs> so uh, I think this is one thing that many entrepreneurs kind of struggle with particularly in the beginning. And I, I, you know, I could be wrong with this, happy to be wrong, but you got to pay to play. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, Dan Pena talks all the time about, you know, earn a million, spend 1.2 million. Yeah. 
yeah. because it keeps us on our toes. Because when we when we don't have a, a game, a backup plan, our life doesn't become a backup plan. And yes, you know, I always talk about burn rate. Have three months bank in the have three months burn rate in the bank. But I operate like it's not there, because if I operate like it's not there, I'm always on my toes. So I take whatever money I had at the time and I put it back into investing in playing with people that were playing the game I wanted to play like Scott and Gary I invested you know I almost spent oh close to a million dollars in two years on coaches and mentors like Gary Scott and a few others yeah I think I I mean like LeBron James he like he famously spends like a million two million dollars a year on his health right on his body right just different things he does right yeah yeah, you definitely got to invest in yourself. And I don't think so many people are cheap and don't want to do it right. What am I going to invest in myself for? That you, but that, yeah, this don't get. I don't think it's kind of they frustrating. Don't. Well, you are the context that creates the content of your life. So you're essentially the vehicle that's driving this whole thing you call your life. If the vehicle is off, if you put gas in a petrol car, well, I think you call it gas in America, but you put unleaded in a leaded car, it's going to break down. Like you are the thing driving your life. You're the best investment you can make. Your business is an extension of you until you get to the point where you can step out of it or you can sell it. Up until that point, it is an extension of you. It will just mirror back to you how you are, your health, emotionally, psychologically, Logically, physically, you have to invest. You have to, have to, have to. So, Kate, okay, so when you pick Gary, Scott, the other coaches, what was your process of picking them, right? Why Why did you pick them versus the uh, another another coach or another person to you know, yeah, spend your money they, on? They all reflected different stages of my journey. So Gary was very much reflective of my, like, hustle kind of stage, like my willful stage, like, and I, I've always, I always have that, but I do waver in and out of it. Um, I just liked what Gary represented. Like I, and I had the opportunity to go and pay to, to, to work with him. So of course I was going to, um, but actually it's a good question. Cause if somebody else wanted me to go and pay, I probably wouldn't have. Why Gary? I know why. And it's the same for Scott. They're both the same type of entrepreneurs I am. That's why I'm the same kind of entrepreneur. I'm creative. I, I hustle. I work hard. I make sure it happens. I don't fit in really anywhere. I've come from nothing. Um, you know, Scott is a creative entrepreneur. He doesn't like his, he doesn't have a big team. He pretty much works by himself. He has actually one staff member. Um, he doesn't think the same way everyone else. He doesn't fit into society exactly the same as me. They were just versions of me further down the track. That's how I picked them. They made me feel normal. Scott was the first person that made me feel normal as an entrepreneur. I thought I was like completely unnormal. <laughs> so, okay, here in the United States, I think we think we're, we're like the capital of entrepreneurship. Everything entrepreneur comes from us. We're the king's entrepreneurship. But I'm pretty sure it's not the case, right? What, what's the what's the view on entrepreneurship in Australia? Do y'all think you're the, like you're the kings and queens of entrepreneurship there, or? I don't know. Maybe. I so keep to myself. You know, I'm like I'm such a loner. I live in the mountains and I don't leave. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like such an introvert. Um, I, I know. I think that everybody still looks at the States to be honest, um, or like Monaco or maybe London, but since COVID hit, to be honest, I don't know if anyone knows where the capital of anything is. Everything's kind of stopped. Like it's, you know, things we're not so gathering as much as we were. So it's kind of hard to have the finger on the pulse, but I still do believe that we think here that the United States are is the head of kind of entrepreneurship, particularly California and Los Angeles, um, Colorado, maybe Vegas, um, Texas. You know, they're the kind of places that we look to in Australia, uh, in my circles anyway. Silicon Valley, obviously. So Kate, we're going to do a big, big shift on the interview now. Next, I want to okay. talk about your tattoo. Ah, my tattoo. Yeah, is, is it like some deep metaphysical meaning behind your tattoo? Um, so yes, actually. This is Kali. Kali is a goddess of destruction. And the reason I got this tattoo is that I believe the only way to create is to destroy. And destroy is an extreme description. But so many people are afraid of destroying things because they want to stay in what's familiar. I knew in order to bring to the world what I needed to bring, I had to be willing to destroy things on a regular basis so I could create new things. 
So I got this tattoo because she represents destruction and rebirth. And that's the only way change happens is through destruction and rebirth, death and rebirth. And so I got this to remind myself, and it's quite big, as you pointed out, yeah, to remind yeah, myself. It, it is, it's hard to miss it. Yeah, it's hard to miss it. <laughs> so yeah, she's a, this, this, she's a goddess of destruction and change. And that's essentially how I live my life. I'm not afraid to move on. Yeah, how, long, how long have you had it? Uh, 18 months. Okay, so not that long then. Not that long. No, I got it in the States when I was there. I think I was there to see Scott. Actually, I did a thing with Scott. So you just wake up on Monday morning and say, I'm going to get a tattoo tonight? Or was it or was the <laughs> top prices behind it? No, I thought about it for a long time. I wanted something to kind of symbolize, you know, coming from the spiritual kind of development space. I worked with spiritual entrepreneurs for a long time and I, I had my plant medicine business. So I was always the odd one out. I was the black sheep. And I kind of really resonated with the Kali energy of, of being the black sheep and being ready to slay the demons and create destruction and chaos in order to rebirth. Whereas everybody else wanted to have love and light and wear white, although I'm wearing white right now. Um, and, you know, like hold hands and make peace. And I was like, no, screw that. Like I'm coming in <laughs> like a hurricane. I'm going to rip it all up and move on. So it kind of, I guess, again, kind of a way to make myself feel normal and to re remember that this energy in the world is just as important as the other energy. Okay. So are there any alternate pieces you were considering, or this was always, always a piece you wanted to get? This is always the one I wanted to get. That was it. And then how did you pick, yeah. how did you pick out your tattoo artist? Was it someone who recommended someone to you or you like, you did a Google search or you had someone in mind the whole time? Um, so I, I searched and I looked at people's work in the Los Angeles area. And then I eventually found somebody, I went in, I met them and I just felt really resonant with them. Um, they're an oceanfront tattoo in Venice Beach. His name's Stilo. He's a great guy. Um, and he, cause I had to sit there for seven hours with this, right? So it had Whoa. to be somebody that I got along with. So, so, you did, so you did it all at one time. And a lot of people like do oh, something like they, they like do stages, like do the outlines and come back later, like two or three, four stages. So you just like, I'm gonna do it all at one time. Yeah. I was like, if I'm getting the goddess of destruction on my arm, I better be brave enough to sit there. Yeah, for the that's, whole damn that's thing. true. Yeah. You, you, find, you kind of defeat the purpose, but if you're doing the stages, yeah. Right. <laughs> So next, Kate, let's talk about the Boss Bitch Business School. I know that's like your passion project right now, something you really like all in right now. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, Boss Bitch Business School was formed when I discovered 2% of female entrepreneurs hit seven figures. And I went, that is not okay. <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> it is crazy, right? And only 35% of them believe it's possible, which is even more crazy. I think that's also the first number. I agree, 100%. Um, so it was formed from that. And basically what I've done is I've input all of my wisdom and all of my skills that I've learned from people like Gary, from Scott, from my other mentors into a digital course that takes people through how to, to pre-launch, launch and post-launch. And so the launch, the whole launch course can literally be hit on repeat. And it's a way of bringing leads, selling and servicing clients either can be automated or you can do it manually if you want to. Some coaches want to stay manual. Some just want to turn on the turn on the machine and let it run and they don't even want to actually do, do the mentoring part of it. But you can mentor as well. It can be just put on repeat and it creates lead sales, delivery, lead sales, delivery, lead sales, delivery for your market, for your brand, digitally, constantly or once, whatever you want to do with it, really. That's boss bitch business. That's what we've done. So 2% is an interesting number because I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that only 2% of females get venture capital money too, at least in the United States, right? So it's like a yeah. common theme with 2% across everything, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. Yeah, it is. It is unfortunate. And like, I'm a little bit controversial with this topic because I don't like people telling me that I'm disadvantaged or like we don't have it as as easy as the men. I think, no, I, I choose what I have and I am, I am, is advantaged. In fact, I think I'm more advantaged because if only 2% are getting venture capital and, and I go in there and I like totally and utterly wipe the floor with everybody, I'm going to get noticed because I'm the only woman. So I see that as an advantage and I'm going to play that so I can get where I want to go. So, okay, talk about being the only woman in the room is like, like you said, of course you use an advantage, but some females like things are disadvantage, right? Mm -hmm. it, how few people go about that, you know, being the only, not only only, but only, only blank in the room, how should people approach being the only blank in the room? 
It's all about how you frame it. For me, it's always an advantage because I get noticed and I want to be noticed. Even if I'm noticed because, remember I said, there's two things that people notice about you, how you look and what you say. Go and master the craft of communication. Rehearse, be better than everybody else. Make sure you're immaculate, stand out, get noticed and then wipe the floor with everybody else because you're going to be noticed straight away because you're different. Use that to your advantage and make sure you're that much better. I love being the only blank in the room. That I thrive on that. And I, I tell like a lot, a lot of college kids look for a job. I like about no I say no go to like Rotary Club meeting, Chamber Comics. I was always like, oh they're so they're old people like yes, but they own the companies, right? And you're gonna be the yes. only young young person there. Everyone's gonna be 50, 60, 70, and you're gonna be like 22 and everyone's gonna go right to you, right? And they're gonna remember you. Yes. And if you actually can back it up with skills and substance, you're winning because people will make unconscious judgments about you. If you're the only blank in the room, like I'm the only woman in a room, for example, of of a bunch of male CEOs, the first thing they're going to make is, oh, well, she'll be over emotional or she'll be this, or she won't be able to negotiate with us. She's a woman. They're too soft. Like the, their unconscious bias that are programmed into us. I'm not saying they're true, but their unconscious bias that generally would be thought of. And if I can go in there and be a better negotiator than all of them, well, they're going to be like, what just happened? Cause they're not going to expect it. <laughs> be the unexpected and be so much better than everybody else. So Kate, for your boss bitch business school, I know it's for female entrepreneurs, but it's like specific niche, like they have to have a um, certain number of employees. Like, is there like a niche that uh, further deep down for them or just female entrepreneurs in general? It's female entrepreneurs in general who are either starting out or they want to scale their business. So it can be people with teams or without teams. In fact, their teams could do the course if they wanted to, the school, um, and then they could run it for them. So it's either or. Um, the the main, And it can even be for men. I actually have a couple of men that are doing the course. If they want to be boss bitches, I'm not going to tell them they can't. <laughs> it's completely fine. <laughs> and, and how long have you been doing this? Boss Bitch is very new. So we launched, we did a soft launch around about six weeks ago. And it, oh, so really new. Our, yeah, really new. Our hard launch is in January. So we're just still in the data testing phase. The message to market match actually has been extraordinary. It's been the most accurate message to market that I've ever managed to have. So I'm super excited about it. It's obviously really needed. And how are you getting the message out about it? Just like your, like your Facebook lives, general marketing, you're doing any paid advertising, paid advertising, just word of mouth right now. Yep. Yeah. Paid advertising. So the lead capture had to look good professional on camera. We've got that going. We've got um, a pre-recorded webinar going. We've got a few ads running on Instagram and Facebook. I will include YouTube and Google soon, but I want to make sure I perfect on Instagram and Facebook first. Um, so we're collecting cold traffic. We're popping them into our email list. And then in the email list, we're indoctrinating them with the, with the values and the philosophies. The open rates are high. Um, we recently just did a, a little bit of a launch out to our list and we got a 5% like convert sale rate. So that's pretty good. 5% sale rate from an email list from cold traffic that have only been on our list for about between anywhere from six to three weeks. Cause we're continuing to run ads is pretty damn good. So what's your vision for the school? Is it like, you know, in five years, that goes from 2% to 10% or like what's your success rate or your goal? What's your vision for it? Yeah. The vision is by 2025, we want to 10 X the 2%. Okay. That's, that's a pretty big goal right there. Pretty lofty. It's pretty lofty. Remember I said I'm extreme. <laughs> yes. So Kate, so I'm guessing you, you have, you have clients in different countries, correct? Yes. Do you have to change your coaching method based on the country or the culture or anything like that? Or is, is the method the same? It's a really good question. I think that va values transcend the culture, to be honest. If people value high performance, they value high performance. Um, if they value freedom, they value freedom. I don't think, I don't really change. I'm just, I choose clients based on values. So it seems to transcend culture at the moment. I've never had to change it. Um, I've never had anyone upset with me about that. I've had them upset with me about other things, but not that. So, so Kate, from your experience, what do successful people do all the time? And what do unsuccessful people do all the time? Successful people, I believe, have a morning routine or some sort of structure in their life. They have discipline. 
it's that simple. I think discipline is a dying art form and not many people actually have discipline. How many, it, how you do anything is how you do everything. Generally successful people are going to be successful throughout all of their life because how they approach their health is how they approach their money. How they approach their money is how they approach their business. How they approach their business is how they approach their relationships. They hold themselves to the highest possible standard. Low standards equals low self-esteem equals lack of discipline equals unsuccessful life. If we reverse it, high standards, like commitment to excellence equals discipline equals successful life. And success is only quantified by somebody's like view of it. Like success for one person will be different to the others. But if they hold themselves to high enough standards and they execute everything with discipline, do what you say, say what you do, then they'll win. Like unsuccessful people lack discipline. Kate, can someone be taught or like mentored or coached to raise their standards? Yeah, I think I think they can. This is a good question. Gary believes that entrepreneurs are born, right? It's like a DNA. Um, I believe that yes, that is true. And life, life births entrepreneurs. I think the military alone is a perfect example that discipline can be taught. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. And I think, I think you, you talk a lot of entrepreneurs, they'll tell you like when you're a kid, they sell newspaper, they sell newspapers, sell lemonade, like every entrepreneur has some kind of store where they like sell something as a kid, right? Yeah. A lot of them sell drugs. That's yeah. actually kind of hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's I funny. Mean, I mean, you think about it. I mean, a lot of these drug dealers were like great entrepreneurs, right? I mean, they had a market, they did <laughs> business. I mean, now it's illegal probably, but yeah, they like, you know, they did all the classic oh, yeah. entrepreneur stuff, right? Well, they were all in crypto first. So yeah. <laughs> Now look at the Bitcoin market, right? <laughs> yeah. So off the subject, so there's a football player in the United States. Uh, I can't remember his name. Plays for Carolina Panthers. Mm -hmm. He had the Carolina pay half his salary in Bitcoin. So he got like a $1.5 million Bitcoin payment yesterday, right? Wow. Yeah. What a smart guy. Yeah. So I thought it was so, so interesting. That's so interesting. He is really intelligent. Yes. I'm yeah, a can, fan. <laughs> can you put on Twitter, like everyone talking about cash, cash risk? I want to be cash free. Today's my first step. I got paid in Bitcoin 1.5. Thanks, Carolinas, for doing this for me, you know. Oh, my but, gosh. So, if anyone knows that guy, I want to talk to him. He's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. So, Kate, what, what's your vision for yourself? Like, do you see yourself being like, you know, the number one coach in your niche five years from now? Do you see like see yourself doing like, like a public speaking tour or like writing books? Like what's your vision for yourself? Yeah, my vision, I 100% see myself leading a new breed of entrepreneurs and that those entrepreneurs essentially are warriors decide, disguised as entrepreneurs. I think the world needs to shift now and we need to move past the, the culture of everybody gets a trophy for just showing up. And it's now time that we actually embrace some discipline and some focus and some resilience and some strengths and entrepreneurs having the ability to, to create autonomous wealth, to not rely on the government, to not rely on employers, we actually have an opportunity to change the planet with the wealth that we build. So I want to lead an army of them so we can begin to make positive impact in the world. And I will do whatever I have to do for that message to get out there. If it looks like writing books, I'll write a book. If it looks like I have to go on Oprah, I'll go on Oprah. If it looks like I have to run for president, I'll run for president. I'm joking. It's a, it's a Trump joke. Um, yeah, like whatever it looks like, I will do. So I'll let that unfold as it goes. But bringing all those entrepreneurs together, I, I really do believe we have an opportunity to make the world a better place. So, Kate, for entrepreneurs, you know, we're always told, you know, keep grinding, don't give up, pivot, you know, don't, you know, you got to keep on going, keep on going. But is there ever a time when you you recommend to someone, hey, maybe this is not for you. Like maybe you just don't get a nine or five. Maybe you're not really an entrepreneur. But would you ever do yeah. that? Yeah, I would. <laughs> I would. I would because it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's really hard. And and it, it, being an entre I think being an entrepreneur since Instagram, you know, allowed us to put it on our bios has become this celebrated, like, yeah. label, right? I'm an entrepreneur slash influencer. 
there you go, right? So it's become this celebrated like label, but the reality of it is it's bloody hard work and it's not for everyone. It doesn't mean that an entrepreneur is better than someone in a corporate job. We're all just people. Out, just do what your passion is. And if that looks like you're an academic or you're a lawyer or you're a cleaner, who cares? But just do what you're passionate about. You don't have to be an entrepreneur because it's trendy. It's just become trendy. And it's a bit of a disaster that it has, if I'm honest. Yeah, I don't think, think many people realize how many things have to line up right for you to be a successful entrepreneur. It's almost luck, right? Like you might have a good team, but then the, one of them spouses get a better job somewhere else they move or there's so many variables, you know, that you, I mean, you have no control. Like you have the great team, great everything, then something changes, right? Not the right market, not this, not that. And it's like, you might have the passion and focus of working like, you know, 100 hour weeks, but sometimes this luck plays a lot with it, I think, you right? Totally, absolutely. Like, what is it? Um what is it success is hard work meets good luck I yeah. think that's the quote I think I think Oprah might have said it and it's true and actually it, your ability to withstand things going wrong and and reserve judgment if it being wrong and just taking all experience of as information and keep focused on your goal is what will make you successful if you cannot remove yourself from judging things as good or wrong or bad or or um or you know, successful or unsuccessful, if you can't remove that and you can't just take everything as information and keep going, you'll have a very hard time because the minute something goes wrong, like a staff member leaves, you may drop the ball and waste six months. And in that six months, your competitor may have got that little bit opportunity that you missed out on. And then the market may be flooded and your business closes. So talk about the points of an entrepreneur, you have to learn how to how to hear no all the time. I think so many people start up sort of a company and they hear no and like, they don't, either don't accept it or their personal reaction, but you're going to hear no over and over again, right? And you have to be able to react to that and like keep on moving, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just feedback. It's just feedback, you know, and then you've got to assess it. Okay, was it a no because I've created the wrong message to market? Was it a no because my sales skills are shit? Was it a no because they actually don't have enough money and I'm targeting the wrong people? Like, why was it a no? Everything is data. Everything is feedback. We don't, we just need to see things like the matrix, like as ones and zeros yes. and then take it, adjust and move on. Like it's no big deal. It's all part of the process. If you never get a no, uh, I'm a bit worried for you. You're not going to be very successful. <laughs> it's quite simple. So Kate, I mean, you're a busy person. You have a lot going on. How do you like keep track of everything? How do you prioritize? Like do you, do you use a calendar? Do you like have some kind of um, product manager tool you like Asana or Trello you use or do you just wake up every day and just wing it? What's your process? No, I have Trello. <laughs> I love Trello. My team, we have Trello. We're all on Trello, except my business partner. I have to relay everything to him. So it's what's on Trello. Um, <laughs> but we all have Trello. And I love it. I'm a huge fan of Trello. I like to be organized. I always prioritize cash generating activities first. Always. Pareto's law. 20% of our actions yield 80% of our results. So I'm very clear on what that is in my company. That's a great point. Why do so many of us focus on like, you know, we have a priority list of one to 10, but we walk on the priority number 27 that day, right? Why do we get, <laughs> yeah. right? Why do we get that so wrong all the time? I think it's just another sabotage technique to keep us stuck, right? Or you don't know what you don't know. Like Pareto's law changed the game for me five years ago when I realized like 20% of my clients created 80% of my revenue. And I was like, shit, I got to get clear on who that 20% is, <laughs> <laughs> which is why I'm not on every social platform known to man, because I'm clear on what the 20% of the social platforms are that yield me 80% of my results. And I double down on that. So people need to get clear on that. I'm lucky that I love marketing, branding, like messaging, positioning, packaging. That's my jam. Whereas my business partner sales is his jam, not my jam. So we're lucky because they're both cash generating activities for entrepreneurs who are more operations and delivery based that don't like those two, find someone who does, get a team that does and, and make sure that's prioritized. Otherwise you'll have all these great courses and nobody to do them and you'll have no money and no business. And so another great point you just brought up, like you have all these great courses, but if you want a great salesperson, you, it would do, do, no, do you no good, right? How did you become such a great salesperson and have people like actually buy your courses? Uh, yeah, that's a very beautiful compliment. I actually, sales is definitely not my strong point because 
I'm, I'm a, you, I sell how I buy. So sales is my strong point. If you buy like me, I'm a yes or a no. I know before you've even pitched me, I don't care how much it is. I'm in like, don't bore me with the details. I don't care. <laughs> Whereas most people don't buy like that. So if you don't buy like that, I'm actually terrible at sales because I can't, I don't want to go through the details. I'm just like, it's a yes or a no. If you need another case study, you're screwed anyway. Another case study is not going to make the difference. Whereas my business partner is exceptional at sales. Like he traveled the world doing sales with success resources and Tony Robbins and Richard Branson. So he's amazing, but I'm very good at getting them in the door and he's great at converting them. So um, if sales is not your strong point, yes, you can learn it. Absolutely. But remember, you have to have behavioral range as a salesperson to mirror everybody's buying style. And if you don't, you'll be like me and great with a very small market and not so great with everybody else. So, Kate, I understand you have something, something for our listeners today. Yay, I do. I do. I do. I have my free video training on how to look like a professional on camera without expensive equipment or feeling awkward. We all know, as we've discussed in this podcast, that that is the way marketing's heading. The platforms are all supporting business. If you want to take your business to the next level and attract more customers and clients, you must be able to leverage video marketing. It's that simple. So it's a free download. I'm going to give you the link. You're going to pop it in the section and then, yeah, download it. Let me know how you go. Jump on my email list. Hear all of my things. So, okay, can you share your social media or other ways, so other ways for people to reach out to you? Yes, of course. You can reach out to me, Kate C. Gray on Facebook or at Kate C. Gray underscore on Instagram or at Boss Bitch Business School on Instagram as well. Super easy. Um, if you see my personal page, I do do a lot of content on my personal page. Feel free to give it a, a follow. If you add me as a friend, probably don't because I never look at those things, but just follow me and start interacting with me on there because I am very active on my personal Facebook page. And to Alyssa, we have the link to her, to her gift and social media on the show notes. And you'll find the show notes at www.cabinstatesallblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends on your favorite podcast, podcast platform. Kate, so we're coming into our talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom on anything you want to talk about? Mm, yes. Um, I'm going to just go back to what I said before. Perception is reality. People will judge you from the minute that they see you. So make sure what you look like is sharp. And when you open your mouth, you know how to communicate. That is how you're going to be the most influential, the fastest, and you will actually create more cash and more clients, the fastest. What you look like and what you say, fix it, address it, do something with it straight away. It'll make a difference. Kate, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. This was fun. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. <laughs>